uh, which we have observed in uh, Cifer galaxies or accreting supermassive black hole in general, having a lower mass uh, black hole at the center. And uh, this is a kind of a cartoon diagram to those who are not familiar with this term called reverberations. So basically what we think uh, that there is an X-ray flash okay, occurring somewhere. The, so this is an accretion disk. You have a supermassive black hole sitting at the center. And there are some region on the vertical axis of the black hole on the uh, vertical to the accretion disk. And you have, have a source of X-rays. And those giving the flashes, so the flash falls on the accretion disk and then it propagates outward. So basically what you see here from the disk is basically the reflection of the flash and then the process of the same thing at different wavelengths from a different distance on the disk. This cartoon diagram was provided to me by Andrew Jopi from UMD. And okay. Uh, this work is basically, uh, I'm not going to present the work I have done, but it's a combination of few other works in a subsequent field. And then what is the problem we have faced while working on the reverberation? So this is multi the reverberations. So an extra flash giving you even the optical and the longer wavelengths. Uh, and then how do we deal with this kind of problem? So <clears throat> I'll first start with one of our recent work by Federico Vincentelli. She published in 2021. It's a long-term campaign of Markarian 110. Uh, and then this is a reverberation mapping, which means you actually map the multiple variability of the innermost accretion disk and in different bands or wavelengths. And you can see this is a uh, kind of uh, uh, mapping which is done for different uh, optical telescope, and this part of the mapping of Mercury and Monte is actually uh, covered by the Swift campaign. So the what idea, the it is around uh, 10 to the power uh, 5.7 <coughs> in log scale. So, <laughs> so uh, yeah, that is the one reason why we choose. This is a slightly bit of on the lower mass mm -hmm. size. So we expect to see stronger variability here. And then you can see as you go from the Z to Z filter, there are variability in different wavelengths, different filters. And then if you see the UV part, the strip part, which covers both optical UV and X-rays, which is shown here, then you can see the top. I'm sorry about the resolution in this picture. But hopefully you can manage. This is the top one, it's the X-ray. Okay. Uh, coming from the Swift XRT 0 0.3 to 10 kb. Uh, Swift do not have really high resolutions, but it is very good for covering any transient or you need to take some periodic or some observation on very regular interval and for very long time. So you can write proposals which can cover like months. So this is around uh, 50 to 100 days around. Uh, so covering around three months. And then you can monitor the low mass sinkers, which are quite bright, and then you can see how the different movements are very at different scale. Now, <clears throat> what happened here? So basically, with respect to the UV filter, we do a technique called the cross correlation. So cross correlation tells you uh, if there is certain variability which are correlated in different wavelengths, then how this correlation follows. So a positive correlation, let's say I am prosperating UV with respect to the X-rays. A positive correlation means UV is uh, UV is leading the X-rays and negative correlation. I mean, it depends on how you define. Negative means the other way down. One is lagging, one is leading. So you can see here the different prosperation function with respect to UV and how this falls on different paths. So now uh, it's difficult to see the actual number here. So here we plotted uh, the lag time delay with respect to UV as a function of wavelength in different filters. So here you can see that in different filters, this is the typical lag spectra, okay, in lagging days. And then what we are trying to do that 
Uh, basically, if you look at this particular green one, the G filter curve, it contains two types of variability. One is actually strong variability, but it's much slower. Like this, you can think of like this. And another underline, which is very, really, uh, it's not very strong, but it's very fast. So it happens in a couple of days or even maybe less, depending on how good your resolution is. So each of the light curve, we can actually decompose into two different types of variability. A faster, but uh, weaker, and a slower, but stronger. So what he does with this filtering effect means, he filtered out the faster, I mean, he separated out the faster and the slower variability by using a uh, filter, while they, they have used a box cut filter, linear filter, these are different techniques. Without doing any filtration, these are the actual data points. So here you can see, this is my uh, trend you know, as a function of wave and power lag changes. Now, we have a model from the standard accretion based theory, you probably know. So from Wine's back body distribution, you know lambda proportional to one over temperature. And then from accretion disks, radius and temperature, they are related to this particular formula. And then you know R equal to C, velocity of light, and tau the time delay. The time it takes to propagate in the disk. And then if you put them all three together, tau is proportional to lambda to the power four over three. So this is so my students is very uh, but <clears throat> so can this be done for any inclination of the disk? Uh, yes. So basically, I'm uh, see marker in one one ten has an inclination of around fifty five degree. Mm -hmm. But now I'm going to show a few other sources which have a different inclination. Very much with respect to the particle. I mean, also. Yeah, yes. axis of the. Yes, this is it. Yes. Okay, so, okay, then uh, what do we see here? Basically, zero means uh, this is the UV wavelength, if you can see that, and this is my X rays. So, X ray to UV kind of falling on the same trend, which means uh, this particular standard is prescriptions uh, kind of fitting my data within the error box. Okay. Now, uh, just work before he published Markan in 110. I worked with NBC 7469. Uh, interestingly, we had a data from uh, RXT. RXT was very good in following, at the initial phase, it actually followed the several sleeper galaxies for a pretty long time. And this is one of the galaxies. We, we can see the X ray light flow in 2 to 15 kV. And at the same time, this is the uh, UV continuum light flow. So this UV continuum light curve I deduced from the IV missions, Inter International UV Explorer. Uh, they are actually giving very nice set of UV spectra, okay, high resolution, mid and low resolution, uh, typically in the band around 1300 angstrom to uh, around 2400 angstrom. And then you can actually model the spectra and you can get the continuum class out of it. So each of these data points coming from each single, single individual observation. Once you calculate the class, and if you plot here, just uh, below the X-ray, we do see that like, it's not very obvious that are there any X-ray correlation or not, long term and large amplitude. But then we blindly do a cross correlation between these two light curves. Okay. What we get is basically a negative lag of around minus 3.49 3 days, which means the UV, <coughs> UV leads the X-rays. So UV is coming before the X-rays, which is around 3.5 days. Now, this is uh, this result was also published uh, around 1995 by Kirpal Nandra. And he also found something around four days lag. Uh, but then he stopped there, like he said, is we really cannot explain what can cause a lag of around four days. I mean, that is too long to be explained by combinations or any other type. But uh, I mean, the same effect we saw in this data. But then what we did, basically we filtered out this long term variability from this light in from both cases. What is left over is, you can see here, after taking 
of the filter, like the filtering in five days or faster. Uh, you can see there are small, small ups and downs in the uh, fast light curves. And we thought that this first variability must be coming or close to the black hole, probably. Then we did the cross correlation between two of these two. And what we find is that X ray uh, is, uh, UV is lagging the X rays by a factor of 0.37 or 0.4 days. 0.4 days are quite kind of the time scale at which the X ray reversion occurs. So if you have a geometry, like azimuth geometry that I showed in the uh, simulation in Paco diagram, you have an X ray source flashing and falling on the disk. And if you assume some typical lens scale, like the source is sitting at 20 RG, and then this flashing occurs at 30, 40 RG, this time scale actually falling that reversion uh, time scale. So we believe that that cartoon diagram has some actual uh, follow can explain this kind of results. Once, yeah, go ahead. basically, so any uh, variability uh, that is uh, lower than uh, five days that was filtered out. So, uh, and you found the lag of let's say half a day or uh, in the other day. So, this filter, I mean, uh, instead of five days, if we take let's say 15 days, we filter out all variations above 15 days. Right. So, changing this time scale mm -hmm. about which you are filtering out all the slower variations, mm -hmm. does this have any effect on what we find in the the lag to be extremely lag. Yes, yes, you are right. There is an effect. So basically, once we, uh, let's say the 10 days, I also tried 10 to 15 days. In that scale, uh, this is much uh, less prominent once you had this 15 days filter. But then I also see that minus 3.49 days lag, which is also prominent. So basically, the filtering can actually reveal the type of uh, uh, variability of the lag at different periods. Uh, which kind of filtering? It's called um, basically it's a it's a functional form of one minus mod of dq over q. So Lewis Lewis function functions. So also the mass scale mass of this is uh, this is uh, uh, um, Five, uh, four point six into ten to plus six solomons. Okay, and the, the box filtering you were doing earlier for the earlier that was what time scale? Yeah, I think uh, this one. So box curve filtering, I think he used uh, when this he did after I published my work. So he took the similar five to six days of filtering. For but there you don't see such no. kind of job. No, right. Yeah, mm -hmm. we don't see such another thing. Popular filter and then we that uh, we are filtering. Uh, mm -hmm. That also works. That also works. But uh, basically, we have to also need to find out how efficient is your filtering. Okay, so basically, uh, once you uh, actually filtered out different uh, ups and downs from this light curve, what exactly remains? Uh, like for example, we use the box curve linear and other from filtering uh, technique. But then we found this lowest has the highest efficiency in actually taking out the uh, any lights. Basically, it does the fitting to the light curve and then right together. So this fitting uh, is uh, actually best with the lowest. Again, we also tried one more exercise. So what we did here, uh, now here I was talking about the X-ray versus UV. Okay? So for very compact region close to the black hole. Now here I do the same, but UV versus UV. Okay. So again, this is fast filter and this is a slow filter. Means uh, one is filtered out for the faster and one is slower. When you use the faster uh, UV versus UV, uh, this peak is actually consistent with zero. So you don't see any fast variability from the disk. And that is what we expect. When you're talking about the disk, the fast variability should wash out as you go away towards the outer disk. But then when we take the slower one, it shows very strong correlation, which is around 0 0.29 days, which means the 1315 angstrom gets the 1825 angstrom by this uh, 0 0.29 days, which is actually uh, <laughs> falls with the reversion lag from the standard. So the, we
We have also done a few more tests on this, but anyway, here is our final plot, which is showing uh, the star is basically the X-ray coming from Swift X at least. And these are few UV filters that we use from Swift U4, the star one. And those GISM uh, spectra filter, uh, from the GISM spectrum, we again calculate the fluxes and the blue points are here. And then we have FOHC uh, is in optical telescope in checking in US probably. So they had some data which is shown here, but in the long run, these are optical. Uh, so if you put all of them together, and then if you try to model with the standard disk here, uh, we see that as you go to the uh, UV, extreme UV to the X-rays, actually this uh, departs, the data departs from the prediction from the standard disk. Even you, this standard disk has this parameter uh, A over A Reddington, even if you use all different types of for A over a uh, value, still we are not able to see how the X-rays are departed from here. The delay is lower. Delay is more than expected. This is the expected delay. Okay, and this is your data point. So 0.5 days extra delay. But then that may be due to the VLR. Mm -hmm. So we cannot say for sure. I mean, that is the problem because uh, 0.5 days delay, we usually expect it is from the disk, but again, uh, this UV continuum, like once you go to the very, very far away from the central object, we do not uh, expect to see strong correlation or stronger variability between the X-rays, central part and the VLR, let's say. But then this UV and X-ray, they are actually very strongly variable, plus they are strongly correlated. So, which kind of do not favor the VLR origin of such variation. So, why okay, can it's not the, on the, yeah, so on the point at the optical sort of 5,000 or 6,000 angstrom, mm -hmm. those points are based on what? If those are still like filtered out, like you were saying, the long term variation is filtered out. Right, right. But that filtering will not have effect at that wavelength. Because uh, here I saw, show that this, if you even filter the first, do not have any cross collusion, only cross collusion you will see the slower variations. So, which means these are mostly the slower variability we see from the outer place. So, we feel that there is no such uh, problem in the filtering. But this entire data, entire plot is done with the same concept, filtering out with the five days. But, uh, I mean, what we see that here, it does not match. But Only then, if that is giving you the, I mean, if the uh, 6,000 angstrom, the, the point of the right hand side are giving you the uh, long term variation, mm -hmm. but that is not due to, I mean, the uh, time scale is uh, actually consistent with the regression. That is what is, so this is data point, these two data points. It's still in so that time scale is what? From the central source to the part of the disk where you have no signal of the That is three, uh, 2.5 light days. Right, right. This is a very large error, but it's one around two, two days. Okay. Okay, so that was the previous campaign we did, and now uh, my postdoc supervisor Ian, he did himself for this NGC 4593. He uh, take this data from around 85 to 6, so 20 days of data, again from the SWIFT campaign. Then we have these x rays and all other filters. You can see in visible the variability is very faint, but as you go to the strong band, uh, higher and higher. Uh, uh, frequencies, you see the variability becomes stronger and stronger. So again, if you do the same technique, and here we do not use any kind of filtering, this is completely unfiltered. And here again, you see the X-rays is again delayed by around 0.6 to 0.7 days with respect to my standard predictions. Okay. Then we again do one so more thing. That is it. That is W1. Is that the white one? No, no, no. The you read read of the the These are the name oh, of the filters. Right. 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 
these are the filter we can use. So, the w, w2 is this one. Yes. Again, so we look at the same source using Hubble Space Telescope. And then uh, in the simultaneously, we use uh, X-ray from the SWIFT. And then here are the uh, here is the plot. Now, because the HST has very good uh, coverage, we have managed with the coverage, but they have very high sensitivity. So then your error bar or variability measurements is kind of much better than the DL studies. And here we saw that there is this kind of train from UP onwards to the optical. I mean, uh, Kaket, Ed Kaket, he put all other lots of telescope in that particular field. Uh, you can see the this Bummer line here, jump. But again, the point here is that X-ray when you plot it here, again it comes back to 0.6 So the question is, we are not very sure what causing this extra delay for the X-rays. So I am very interested or keen to understand what is going on the X-ray part. So I started with putting all the X-ray reversion. So coming from my table was the X-rays. So I think. Uh, many of you may know the X-ray spectra, how it looks like for typical super galaxies. So these one are the two examples from uh, 180707 minus 495. So in the X-ray spectra, if you feed with a single power line, and if you plot with the residuals, you will see there is a uh, two features here around close to 0.9 kb, which is Adam L alpha line, and this is Adam K alpha line. These are the two lines which are are in process due to the flashing that X when X ray flashes hit the disk. We are expected to see these two lines. And then in between, you can see the residual is close to one, I mean, ratio. So, which means this part is dominated by the power law. So, probably this is what we see directly from the uh, that flashing stuff, okay, what we call the corona. <clears throat> and this is again another uh, residual which ratio after fitting with the power law, and you see. These are the three uh, peaks. So one is in this case probably this is uh, uh, although this is claimed in some paper as a L alpha line, but the shape is very unusual to become a line. So it might be the case of a soft axis that we see, and then the iron line and probably the confirm confirm confirm. Now, uh, how do I explain or see the uh, extra reverberation. So there are two processes which are simultaneously going on in this uh, in these cases. So one we have already talked about the extra reverberation. You have a flashing and reflected or reprocessed from the disk. So the reprocessed emission you are seeing, and you are also seeing the direct emission, and then you are trying to cross correlate what we did earlier you know, to get the lag. So in that case, you will get this negative time lag, which means because you you are getting UP here. From the disk and excess from the corona. So then UV would be lagging from the excess. And this is the typical time scale, lag time scale that is computed from a uh, relativistic code. Okay, so where we assume a corona and then it is uh, put in the vertical axis and then you have a reflection and then uh, the photons are affected by the gravity of the black hole, so they are an extra delay. And <laughs> then you can move the corona up and down to actually explain the observed extra variability in this case. So, anyway, for a typical uh, configuration, this is the model predicted lag. How, how lag you say the model was predicted, like the left hand side is model, right? This is model, yes. And how was it done? Is that so, yeah, we have this um, ray tracing model. So where you have an extra flash, and then how is 6.4 kV photon uh, actually uh, is produced from that lag, including the black hole mass, geometry, and then gravity, all other spin, all other parameters. So then, uh, what is the time delay you are expecting due to the different configuration? So this and is in seconds, the y-axis, or, or yeah, it's in second, right? Yeah. As a function of the frequency of your variability. Similarly, another flag, which we know as the propagation delay propagation lag, uh, which basically tells about that you have some uh, fluctuation in your accretion disk, which is propagating towards the black hole. Sorry, I might be okay. How much time I have? Okay. Mm -hmm. really no. Let's say uh, yeah, 15 minutes. Okay. 
So this is known as propagation lag, which means from the outer disk towards the inner disk, some fluctuations is propagating. And that propagation occurs slowly, means uh, kind of discussed time scale that we have to. And then those propagation can uh, uh, actually uh, process here and gives you the reprocessed emission, or also known as the confirmation lag. So this lag actually dominate in the lower frequency. So as you put the lower and lower frequency, it will, uh, it will uh, become higher and higher. This is also in second, 500 seconds, 1000 seconds, 1500 seconds. So this is predicted for a given black hole mass, for a given black hole spin, so for a given geometry, basically, for the navigation. What we see here, I mean, from the observation, is a combination of both of them. <laughs> so it will look like this if we put them together. Okay, this is what is the predicted lag from this, if these two things are happening simultaneously in a black hole system. Now, this is what we see. So here is a com compilation of six different super galaxies. And then this is the uh, computed lag and the function of the clear frequency. And this is the one model on the top for each case. One that this one is the propagation and this is the reverberation. You fit them together, and then this is the fitted spectra. Uh, so now from the fitted spectra, you can calculate several black hole parameters. So these are kind of three parameters. For example, black hole mass, the spin, the inclination angle, the height of the corona. Okay, and the, uh, <laughs> the power law index of normalization. Anyway, so from this fitting, you can actually find out these parameters. That is how the how powerful is this technique. So uh, probably you have heard of like uh, the reverberation technique to measure the black hole masses. But this is one way. Only using the extra data, we can. If you can fit the with this model, we can actually get so the what are the exact this is the Fourier frequency of your, uh, so we are now talking about different uh, variability, right? The time scale. Oh, okay. Uh, so the Fourier frequency. Time like Yes. So if you remember, the the slower one is basically the one which is coming from the action disk, and the faster one is basically coming from the reverberation. So this is cross spectrum of uh, the two light. Like, Yes, this is calculated from the cross spectrum for different black hole sources. <laughs> like, um, okay. And one, uh, as I told you, one interesting aspect or uh, out, outcome of this particular modeling technique is that just from looking at the uh, your negative lag, okay, the reversion lag you are getting, and what is the at what Fourier frequency you are getting this lag. These two parameters can tell you uh, the black hole masses. So this uh, Barbara Di Marco, he, she actually worked in 2013, taking a whole lot of sample for super galaxies just to predict in the tau, the delay, negative delay, and the Fourier frequency at which the negative delay is calculated. And then she found that black hole masses are kind of, uh, I mean, it looks like uh, have some correlation with these two time scales. New lab and the tau. <clears throat> I mean, this is not, uh, uh, I mean, proven. I mean, you cannot, you can, re you can repeat this exercise and try to find out these plots. And then she also found that these are these three: one rg, two rg, and six rg. This is the height of the corona, so it changes the slope of this particular plot. So this is also sensitive to these parameters we are using for the field. So I took, uh, I was interested to find out this, uh, what is happening to the innermost part of this black hole like in excess particular. I took, again took the same source NGC 4593. The reason I took, because it shows very strong variability. So starting from here, uh, you can see the down rate within like a few hundred milliseconds, it goes from the 89th comes to almost two and then again goes back. Even uh, this is taken in 2016, if you compare this with uh, 2002 and 2010 data, this boundary is way off, even for the XMM. You can see a maximum around 10 in 2002. I think I like, but anyway, it is going all the way up to uh, 20 to 25 pounds per second, which is pretty different. So I was, I was interested to find out what is happening with this source. So what I did, 
I uh, this is the complete line curve, and then I just uh, divide the line curve into different segments. Okay, and then for each of these segments, I uh, extracted the spectra and treated with a simple power law. And what I saw here, these different colors are for different segments, the spectra from different segments. What I saw here, as you see below 1 kV, the spectra has a very drastic changes in the uh, flux. Okay. And this is the iron line. So this is the iron line, this is zoom. And you, this iron line is narrow, it's not very broad. So broad, it's uh, not coming, it's not affected by the gravity of the black hole. But this, Strong variation in the UP or the soft, uh, sorry, in the soft axis, it tells me that this must have some connection with the actual variability that we see in the X ray or what we propose in the X ray flashes. So, what I did uh, before coming to the actual light spectra, we also try to find out the origin of this UP using different spectral modeling. So, here uh, is the XMM spectra, and then this is the model we have used. To do the find out the best fit one. So, primary continuum, it is a power law. Then, we do see distant reflection, we use a zilber. And then, neutral and ionized partial covering to take care of this power part. So, these are the combination we may use. And then, we assume, okay, let's say we have a warm compromise for soft axis. And then, we use a simple edges from uh, thermal compromise, which is the blue part. And you can see the, this combination of the models are quite. Uh, working well for this case, but then when I change the model, means I keep this tree same, only this part which actually taking over this axis here. Instead of a warm compromise, I take a uh, high density reflection model okay, called Renzin. That can also actually mimic my observed UV axis. So, which means using the spectral modeling, we are not able to figure out its origin, either warm compromise or high density. So then I calculated the time delay between these two energy bands, one which is dominated by this soft axis and another by the power. So what I observed here is kind of similar that you see. Okay, so I saw this uh, there is a one excess in the positive direction which is coming due to the propagation fluctuation, but then you have this negative lag, which is probably coming due to the reverberations. And that is uh, that is what we find it out between these two bands. And then I compare this six to eight kV. Uh, you know, six to six point four kV is the position of your iron emission line. And then typically they are kind of broad. So six to eight kV, we believe it is dominated by the reflection part or the iron line. So for surety, I take this six to eight kV. So my iron or reprocessed region. And 1 to 5 kV, this is dominated by the power, the direct flash coming towards the, from the floor. And if you calculate the time lag as a function of frequency, you do see a strong uh, negative lag, which means, and this is probably due to this iron line. Okay? And it is around 400 seconds. Okay? So because iron line is known as the reprocessed emission from the test, but UV excess or soft excess is not known. The origin is not clear. So, so I, I was trying to compare <laughs> the iron line with the soft axis. And what we see here, the soft axis and iron line are both reprocessed from the primary hard X-ray continuum. The reason is it also shows a negative lag, but the amount is around 100 seconds or so. And this is the iron line lag, which is around 400 seconds. Second is soft axis origin may be more compact than the iron emission line. The time scale of the lag is basically tells you from which part of the disk it is actually formed or how compact it is. So basically, the UV axis, uh, soft axis is coming from uh, a delay having only 100 seconds compared to the iron line, which is having a uh, lag of 400 seconds. It tells that it might be, and your error bar is quite small. This error are calculated using the Markov chain non decal simulations. So so it tells us that at least the soft axis is coming from more compact region than the iron line. I mean, I don't know from where, okay, but it's still more compact than the iron line. And then here uh, I do the reverse, which means in the x-axis now it's energy, and in the y-axis in the time lag, 
But now I am calculating the time lag as a uh, with respect to this energy band, which is dominated by the uh, uh, power law. I mean, <coughs> continue. Then here you can also see this. This is my again iron line lag, which is 400 seconds, and this is my soft texture below 1 kV. <coughs> the soft texture is dominated. It is around again 80 to 100 seconds. But otherwise, this lag is consistent with the, I mean, the error bar is large and it's mostly consistent with the zero lag. So only these two regions, soft axis and the iron line, this portion, has some uh, stronger indication that they are actually coming from reprocessed emissions. And then I do the modeling of the pressure using this uh, KY Rivar model. That actually the model was developed initially by uh, Mikhail Doxia. He is from uh, Prague. Uh, Astronomical Institute, and then his students took out that project. He joined as a postdoc with Ian McCarthy, and then I joined at the same time. Then we started working together and then tried to find it out. Okay, anyway, so this is the reverberation lag, and this is the propagation lag, and the red one is the resultant of this model. So by fitting this model, we find this the corona, I mean, this X ray flashing region is at a height of around six to seven, six to eight RG. And this is my inner disk radius and the black hole spin fixed to 0.7. I mean, this model is very really, uh, nice if you have a good quality data. I mean, the prediction will be much, much better. I mean, you can see the data quality is not very good here. Only three, four, five points are away from the zero tag. Otherwise, most it is consistent with the zero one. But that is the what best we got so far. And then, the these are my predicted black hole masks from the model fitting. And this mass is quite close to the one observed from the So now we are uh, a kind of uh, from this at least for NGC 4593, we are kind of uh, kind of okay to understand that maybe the soft texts have similar origin as the iron line, like the reposition emission, but they are coming from two different uh, different area, different regions of the entire systems. But then, what causing such strong variation in the extreme flux for the primary one? Again? So this is again, you can see going down from 15 to around 4, 5, but it is again, in this case, going all the way up down that side. So basically, even if we, I don't have them in much more exposure after points, but if you can take, maybe it will again increase further. So this is one uh, tools, this uh, finding out the lag spectra at different frequency to find out know, what is happening at different flux level. So basically, uh, okay, let me, yeah, so let me, uh, before coming to the actual spectra, let me talk about one more source, IRES 13224. Here, uh, the same work, similar type of work is done by Erin Kara in 2013. What she do it, she took a small part of your X-ray light curve, which is shown in the blue, and then one part of, another part of the X-ray light curve is shown in the um, uh, this magenta color. The idea is I want to understand what causing such large extreme players at this particular portion of the light. So she did, uh, she actually calculated. Compare the last case in the high flux here as the minimum occurring at lower frequencies and it has more time scale, like longer time scale, around 400 seconds. But the pink one, a magenta one, you can see here, the time scale is much lower, around 100 seconds, or close to 100, 150 seconds, but it is happening at higher frequencies. So basically, there is a difference in the lag spectra at different flux level. Now, how do we interpret this spectra? How do we model this spectra? That is next step, which we are trying to do with that qi one model. But at least it is proven that the high flux and the low flux have very different lag spectra. 
So the similar technique I was trying to apply on the uh, on this source in this four five nine two. So I define my high flux here and the low flux here, and then trying to calculate the lag spectrum and function of the frequency. This is what I found. It's not very optimistic I and mean, very positive result, I would say. But uh, this is just taken for one observation. And now my student Sri, she is working in this particular project. She is trying to find out all uh, different observations having the similar flux level and I mean high flux level and similar low flux level and try to put them together so that this error would be improved. And then uh, one result that we tentatively saw that again that there is a shift in the frequency, minimum frequency, uh, which is kind of interesting because the shift tells you, so how do you explain the shift, for example? So there is a shift from here to here. <coughs> how do you explain this shift? This explain, uh, can be explained uh, by this model, by changing two parameters of the actions, what we found. Like we have good, many tested, but this one, what we found very significant changes. So if you increase the ionization, this ionization by a factor of three, by a factor of five, you see the reverberation lag time scale increases. So this is by factor of five change. Means let's say you take the ionization of um, 0 0.5, which is your 1x and 3x and 5x, which is the change in the lag. But you only see the lag time scale is changing. They are all occurring kind of same frequencies. And then what we change is the height of the corona, means height of the external flashing region. So I put it at 2 RG, 5 RG, and 9 RG. I don't see any change in this lag time scale, but I do see a change in this frequency. So at 9 RG, frequency is lowest. 5 RG there and 2 RG here. And then if you combine these two effects, the change in the coronal height as well as the ionization, this can actually explain the shift in the frequencies as well as the amplitude. So remember, there are two things happening here. One, the shift in the temporal frequency from higher to lower, and another is the change in the lag time scale from 400 to 200. So these two things can be explained for a given source by changing the these two parameters. One is the coronal height and the energy. So coming to the future and the summary of my talk. So we first started our work to find out what is happening on the multi wavelength scale from X-rays to optical. And then we found there are some issues with the X-rays uh, because X-rays have extra delay, which cannot be, we don't know how to explain really, to be honest, and until now we don't, we're still working on that, but not sure. So basically some of you, the young minds can come up with some idea to explain those things. And Second thing we saw that in this particular case, uh, one case, in this 4593, uh, we have to change the height of the extra flashing region as well as the ionization of the test. These two parameters simultaneously can explain my uh, the observed lag spectrum of the amount of lag. And the third thing we see at this four is four five nine three. Now we are trying to extrapolate that um, that work uh, to from four five nine three to other sources to improve whether my soft excess and the iron line can be explained by the similar reprocessing scenario. Okay. Thank you very much. So I guess uh, the chair is out taking yeah. a call. So the question. You and yeah. Talk. Question. Yes, sorry. At the very beginning, you said that you took the galaxy where the black hole mass is roughly 10 to the power 5.7. The reason you said that due to the low.